Hello and welcome to a Mjolnir the Movie special. This is on the platform, the YouTube platform Dust. Now I said that Dust, uh, in a previous episode of Mjolnir the Movie, is now showing that Dust was a studio and I got that completely wrong actually. It's just a YouTube platform where people can put science fiction films that they've created, short science fiction films as it happens, short fiction, onto there and obviously it attracts quite a number of views uh, anything uh, up to a few million actually so it is mm -hmm. quite popular yeah now uh, neil's not with us again which is why we're doing this special but uh, i'm here with james hello james hello hello and so uh, what's your first pick then james because uh, we we're going to look at a few of the ones that uh, have piqued our interest as we've been watching a few of these films so uh which have you chosen first, then, James? Well, one I picked. It was uh, I, I picked mostly at random. I thought, right, there's so many you can't possibly watch them all off the bat and remember them. So I, I picked some at random. I picked one. It was called Black Hole, oh, and I, I was I, glad I, I did. I haven't seen that actually. I don't think it's it's actually excellent. I mean, it's very short. That's that they, we should probably explain that to people. The Dust platform is essentially short films with a sci-fi theme, but other than that. It's mostly open to whatever kind of lens. Some of these films are under three minutes long. Some of them are 15, 16 minutes. It's about about that 20 minute probably is the upper limit. They would, I doubt they would stop anybody, but just probably for production costs and short story writing, that's what you tend to end up with. Yeah, and but the, 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 some of them tend to be very, very short as well as um, I've mm. noticed. And, and some are not really stories as such but more artistic kind of thing uh, i noticed one or two like that uh, dust's also got a website as well i noticed ah i didn't know that mm. but we could uh, put in a link for that yep. let people uh, discover it put a link to the channel as well we'll put that in the description or below yeah but yeah. I, mean, I mean they have quite a wide variety of things on there that obviously some are political some are not and uh, mm you know you do have quite a variation so you do get some that are carrying sjw narratives and that kind of thing although we'll be looking at that i dare say as we go along but but some uh, are just uh, apolitical and the there are also great variations in quality we'll come on to that in a mm. bit because i've chosen one that's um <laughs> extremely bad actually in oh, terms of quality uh, just to sort of uh, show the levels that uh, we can get down to as well as some excellent quality ones which i think are far better than the stuff hollywood is producing but anyway back to the black hole oh uh, well the black hole is quite a, a good example of somebody who knew the talent that they had access to be it from themselves or from the team and worked within that for the story he wrote and for how he produced it and I think that's why it's excellent. I would say it was practically flawless from a production point of view for what he wanted to achieve. It's a story set in an office where a guy on his, his shift looking bored, it's late at night, and while he's waiting for the printer, the office printer to work, one of those huge office printers, you know the type of, I mean, with a photocopier built in, and out of it while he's waiting for his stuff pops this big sheet of paper with a big black filled circle on it and he oh, just yes, it. I, I have seen it yes <laughs> mm. and he sits it aside and you think all oh, right okay but curious and while he's getting his stuff printed he sits his coffee cup down and the coffee cup vanishes inside this hole and from there you get the the premise of the story there's and it's well done because there's no explanation it doesn't try and give you the physics of it it's just a mysterious object thrown into a normal situation how would it possibly unfold and that's what makes it interesting it's a good bit of writing and what makes it even better as i said is of worked within the limits where the special effects for it are incredibly simple it's something that probably you could learn to do with the right software in a couple of months this could be done before cgi as well the effects and this is not something that would require high-end anything but it's just well done somebody thought well what can i do what can i write within those limits and what can i make this interesting and they write a very interesting story that you don't feel bored watching it's short it's probably only about three minutes or so but it tells a small story with a good ending i don't know if i want to spoil it because it is only three minutes so if i go into it too much it's just ruined maybe yeah 
it's very much like an old episode of The Outer Limits or yeah. The Twilight Zone, that kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, very much. I, think I got that feeling from it, and I thought, it's well done. It's a good example to any writers or potential filmmakers or ones currently involved how to work around and with your limits and make something good without showing the, the limitations that you have, if you see what I mean. You know, if you can't do big CGI space battles, don't do them. Because <laughs> then the audience won't be going, oh, God, that's terrible looking, and it won't bring it down. That's right. Uh, often you have to write for the budget that you have, uh, quite simply. I and mean, that's the same in Hollywood as well. I mean, yeah. And even with Hollywood talent pulling money, if somebody says you've got to write X with one million, which is a hell of a lot of money to m most people, even short filmmakers, that's not going to give you the same result as uh, James Cameron getting 100 million. Yeah, I mean, Neil and I, uh, we looked at John Carpenter in an earlier episode uh, before you joined us. And it, one of the things we looked at was the way John Carpenter gets around a lack of budget. And mm. often he's actually at his best when he's doing that. I think that's a consistent thing I've noticed where the limits imposed in an artist, although he'll chafe against them, often produce the best work consistently yeah as we say of course necessity is the mother of invention when you just give them a essentially a limitless budget what do you actually get you get the sort of terminator 3 <laughs> instead of terminate the terminator the first one yeah and actually john carpenter's probably been at his worst when he's had a big budget i mean one only has to look at uh, some of his later stuff and it's not really as good as the stuff that he did in the 80s, really up to, I suppose, uh, that awful sequel he did to for Escape from New York. I mean, that oh, uh, Escape, God, the CGI yeah. And... yeah, Escape from L.A. is absolutely awful, even though he had a big budget for it. So just goes yeah. to show you. And, it, and the thing about that one was it was badly written, badly directed, terrible effects. It, it, there was no excuse for it, really. No, that's right. And he probably pocketed most of the money because he was... Probably... <laughs> <laughs> well, he was very legally and fairly, we'll add. Legally and fairly. <laughs> yeah. well, well, I know that he was extremely pissed off with Hollywood at that time, so he probably thought, oh, bollocks to them, I'm just going to take the money and run. <laughs> <laughs> legally, legally. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I, can't, I can't blame him, really. For that i mean it did it did do some really good films for hollywood which were not appreciated mm. Mm. so um anyway uh, one one thing that uh, i'll bring up then as you're talking about a lack of budget is a film called ruptured which is an again an extremely short film and done with very few special effects whatsoever but i think that again it's wonderfully done as regards storytelling which is a very simple story actually and it's really ooh, probably three scenes or something like that that it has in it yeah so it, and there are very few actors in it is i mean the main actress is just about the only main character in it in fact she is the only main character and then the others just appear really on the peripheries and it's a great film about the dangers of AI, but equally on plugging into technology, as everyone's doing now. Mm. And it sets off with this broadcast, this news broadcast, in the background, really. And is this guy, you don't see him on the television, is obviously on some kind of... Uh, discussion show or news report or whatever warning of the dangers of AI and one of the things they say which I think is very interesting it might be lost on people because you're not really listening to him that much because you're concentrating on what the main character is doing and mm. it sort of throws you which I think is nice it's nicely done it's very well directed actually and the guy in the news report or whatever he says it's science fiction that informs most people's expectations i thought that, that was a wonderful little quotation that was just mm. slipped in there just very innocuously and when you think about it that's very true it does inform our expectations yeah and 
things are propagandized uh, through science fiction quite a lot. Obviously, H.G. Wells was a huge propagandist. And in this particular story, we have these wireless earphones for uh, apparently a truly immersion sound, uh, as it says on the box. And they're being sent out, but they're being sent out with a sort of AI virus. And, you know, when people wear them, then they're brainwashed. And mm. it's um, that's the story, basically. But it's so well done. It's so well acted and so well directed. And I really recommend it. And it just shows what can be done with a very little budget, uh, but a bit of imagination. It's an ideal lesson and great entertainment for everybody. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it really, as I say, it was about, what, seven minutes, something like that, that was all. That, thinking about that film and these in general, one of the things about the Dust platform that's good is that film it might take a small team six months a year to make. Now, obviously, the trouble that is getting these things seen, I've seen short films on YouTube just put up on their site. Fantastic, and they get maybe, if they're lucky, 70,000 views if it gets viral over the years. Well, you look on Dust, I mean, these some of these things are getting seven and a half million views or more because it's a, this uh, channel is putting out to people constant content that's attracting the attention. So everybody that's uh, joining in in this communal effort gets a bit of the benefit of it rather than them all trying to do their own thing. You know, putting one video up every six months or once a year, mm -hmm. a very short film. This is a, is a good format or platform for these kind of artists. The I mean, concept certainly sound. Th there are sort of a number of themes that keep coming back up, of course. Uh, the big themes of AI and virtual reality, robots, mm. uh, very current themes. Aliens, of course, are always a perennial. Big th Brother, anything like that. Yeah, that's, that, that's right. Dystopian fiction and so on. So these things come back, but that's just the same in Hollywood, obviously. Mm. And I think that some of these are equally as good as Hollywood. Um, have you got uh, one or shall I go? Oh, I'll go for it. Seeing as we've talked about the low budget and uh, well done, I'll talk about one that's maybe good effects but problems elsewhere. There's mm. one called Ra, uh, R apostrophe H-A. It's quite a striking uh, thumbnail with this kind of snake-headed alien on the cover. And it's a very cliched story, but the effects are fantastic. Whoever uh, made this obviously had on board a very good, well, it's an individual or a team, uh, CGI experts. It has uh, great spaceships in it, cities under attack, you know, all the kind of effects, uh, a kind of robot AI. That's It's a very basic premise where the AI soldiers turn against this alien civilization. And it's such a cliche. <laughs> you can see everything coming before it happens. It's, that's why it's bad writing. It's not even... Uh, it doesn't even feel particularly fresh. Oh, you watch it, and you, because it's it's six minutes or so, you can enjoy the CGI for what it is. So that's the one advantage of all these. Even if you get a bad one, you're watching through the Dust Channel, it's only going to take maybe 15 minutes of your time at worst, probably five minutes. So you don't have to worry about wasting a lot of time and money on it like you would go into a cinema experience or something. But the CGI is fantastic for a short production, a small production. But it shows, though, a different kind of week. Somebody's written this with tremendous talent backing them. But the writer was terrible. The director should have said something, done something, got it rewritten. It's just, it shows a nice example of a squandered talent and uh, budget almost. Which is a shame to see with a short film because it's you know visually fantastic, but it's terribly written. You get absolutely quite, terrible. Yeah, you you get quite a number of those that really they have nothing to say. Almost these. I, I wouldn't even mind. I mean, like the black hole didn't have any kind of big deep meaning, or you know, there was it was just entertaining, and it was you know you enjoy the way it, you said like the outer limits type episodes. It was a very short one of those. I enjoyed it. It didn't need to give me any great deep philosophy or meaning, but this thing's not even originally entertaining or amusing. It's just so cliched and predictable, it just dragged it all down. And I thought, 
what a waste of all this talent that could have gone into any number of these other much better writers for sci-fi that are on this. <laughs> so... If only that CGI could have been transplanted into something else, because whoever did it really knows his stuff. You know, it was it was really high quality stuff, and with good writing, you know, I hope he does get good writing. He can do, you know, he could go far. Yeah. Well, as regards amusing but not really deep or anything like that. Uh, there's a good one called Deep Clean. I don't know if you've seen that. And it's a, it's a bit of a comedy film. It's uh, very odd, actually, because it's sort of part eeling comedy. It's a British one, by the looks of things, because they're all British actors in it. And in fact, there's Paul Kay in it, if you remember Paul Kay from Dennis Pennis and so on. He's in it. And it's... Uh, bit of an eeling comedy with a twist uh, because we're dealing with interdimensional aliens and so on that sort of disguise themselves as anything that they can get their hands on and they transform <laughs> and, and and there's these uh, this team of guys who have to go in and deal with them and they're disguised as workmen you know these ordinary workmen and so they have this like little workman's tent and so on they cordon off roads and everything <laughs> uh, you see, you know, it's, it's it's quite hilarious. Although the the problem is that the thumbnail gives away the ending on dust. Uh, so ah, that, that, that's that, a mistake. Yeah, that, that was pretty stupid. Um, but yeah, the the effects are good. Um, there's a bit of a horror element to it. You know, so mm. so there's comedy horror as well as sci-fi, and uh, and also there's a bit of drama in there as well, because there's this teenage kid is starting work it's his first day on the job at this what seems to be this uh, roadworks gang he's lost his father and he doesn't know how he's lost his father exactly but you know his uncle's uh, there he picks him up his uncle and uh, takes him to the job and his, his father worked with this gang and was killed by aliens you know but, uh, so, uh, and he fi finds out what you know what was what's going on really so th that's a that's a nice little one as as i say there's uh, there's really quirky ones as well i suppose mm. um, I, it's it's such a good format the short story format really for writers because you can make a very dense interesting story you don't have to worry about padding it out because this is what I hate about TV now, especially the kind of long commission series where they add in all this padding and filler episodes that you've no interest in watching. It's such a despicable thing from a artistic or writing point of view, the whole concept of a filler episode or padding in a story, really, because it's deliberately damaging the quality. Well, with this, you, you can get something that's... If you've got an idea that's great and it lasts three minutes, that's what you put up. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, I, one, the wonderful thing about shorts is that you've got no time for filler. If you if there's something bad, you just take it out, pair it back to just the good stuff. And Dust works around that. They've got their own Sunday night viewings, if anybody's interested in going to the channel. They've got a Sunday night compilation, essentially, of these things. So it gives you this sort of hour or so of sci-fi like you're watching a regular tv show yeah which is a great idea about bundle them together it was quite a common format in the past to have short stories bundled together as a with a something a, a wrapper around it mm. uh, even in the cinema i used to get uh, films like that although i'll be honest I've, I've avoided that because i like to be more selective about what i'm choosing because you get an awful lot of these neo-feminist garbage where you've got the woman as a hero this really kick-ass <laughs> hero and so on. Sue. yeah that's right mary sue there are quite a number of those kind of videos around well you're, you're bound to get a lot of wish fulfillment stuff with mm. uh, sci-fi and somebody getting the chance to do what they want it's, it's bound to end up a bit like that so and wish, then wish of course you're, you're, you're saying that uh, the male directors wish they were girlies Probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not even. That's, that's not throwing me off. I'm just when I hear that, I think yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. Uh, no, I, I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> but if you want a very passive experience, something to turn on while you drink your beer, you could do that. You know, rather than maybe pick one, pick another, pick another. Different people have different sort of viewing habits, so they they have catered to that 
to sort of keep everybody happy, which is a smart thing. But obviously, the you then get the issue of it's somebody curating it, so you're not getting just what's submitted as it appears. You're now getting a curated list. I don't know if they just put on the latest, probably not. You know, there'll be somebody picking out what they like. So you might get the same things appearing, or as you say, you might start getting, you know, the, the cliche, high-kicking girl, kicking ass, and so on. Hmm. Well, speaking of quality, because you were talking about high quality, I've got one which is probably the worst one I've seen, because uh, the quality is that low. It comes from France, <laughs> of all places. Because France, uh, I mean, when they do something bad, they do it really bad. And it's, <laughs> it's called... <laughs> It's called an eldritch place, which, um, as you can quite imagine, it's a Lovecraftian thing. Uh, mm -hmm. I say thing, I don't know what it was exactly, because the, I, I mean, it was so poorly done. It was an attempt at doing a Lovecraftian pastiche, but it failed on every single point, because the acting was awful, the direction was awful, the special effects were terrible, <laughs> and the plot had so many holes in it was like a French cheese? No, a Swiss cheese. But anyway, <laughs> in, this, in this case, it was a French cheese. Um, and it smelled as bad as a French cheese as well. But <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, that's one to avoid, uh, even by the diehard uh, H.P. Lovecraft films. Although I will mention, I will mention that apparently a Lovecraftian film is due for release with Nicolas Cage in, strangely. In fact, the finest actor of our generation. Uh, not the bees! <laughs> not the Cthulhu! Not the Cthulhu! <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is uh, uh, this is going to be a, make, um, a remake, I should say, because uh, it has been filmed before, which is The Colour Out of Space. Mm. And the director, interestingly, is Richard Stanley, who directed, I don't know if you remember, Hardware, uh, which was about, what, uh, the end of the 80s or 1990, something like that. I don't know mm -hmm. if you remember. It was a cult film, sci-fi horror film. I can't remember it right now. I've probably seen it, but I can't... It was, can't it, it was famous. It was famous, and it's actually the, one of the few bits I remember of it, other than the robot itself, because it's about a killer robot going on loose. Uh, you know, it re reassembles itself and goes out killing people. So, uh, sort of Terminator-esque. It was obviously coming off the back of uh, the Terminator and that kind of old genre that had cropped up. Mm. Um, because there were a few rip-offs of Terminator that came after it during the 80s and into the 90s. But uh, hardware, I remember, was famous other than that for having Lemmy in it as a taxi driver. <laughs> <laughs> so a few turn up in these films at, the, at that period, isn't it? Yeah, it'd be, uh, quite bizarre. Uh, I think Iggy Pop was in it as well, if I remember rightly. But uh, they've, they've uh, apparently filmed uh, The Colour Out of Space, so uh, there, there we go, uh, with Nicolas Cage. Could be one of those so bad it's good. Uh, it could be, it could be. I hope they've made a good job of it, because I'm... A, very much a fan of Lovecraft's work so it would be nice if they've made a good job and it's one of my favourite Lovecraftian tales as well so do you think they've written around how Nicolas Cage acts <laughs> uh, they should have probably made him Cthulhu because you can't overact Cthulhu surely this giant tentacle monster thing from the beyond <laughs> just have him shriek and freak out as he comes through the portal <laughs> just say go for it Cage just be Cage <laughs> Uh, the the other thing that's interesting about Richard Stanley, the director, um, who's also written the script, by the way, and, and that is uh, that he was actually the first director on the island of Dr. Moreau, you know, the Val, Val Kilmer film. Yeah. And he was sacked from that, uh, apparently, <laughs> because of a big dispute with Val Kilmer, because uh, Val Kilmer is very easy to get on with, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so they kept Val Kilmer and got rid of him anyway so um, yeah <laughs> so we'll, we'll see what that's like then but anyway back, back, back an interesting thing to tear into 
yeah, back to dust anyway. Uh, what, what have you? Uh, what have you got? Well, I, I had a look at what was the most popular. I thought it'd be quite interesting to see what was what was getting all the the hits on the channel. <laughs> I did get quite a laugh, but you know, so I went to videos most popular first. And the two most popular are a woman in an underwear lying back in bed. And the next one is a woman in lingerie opening her coat <laughs> you know, to reveal it. And I thought, ah, right, I can see why these two got popular. <laughs> <laughs> so the old tricks still work. If you're making a thumbnail for your short film and there's any scene at all of a bird in her underwear, bang that one on. It doesn't matter if it's completely <laughs> meaningless to the story. <laughs> That's what goes on. <laughs> so were they any good anyway well the first one was uh, The Promise which was a French one which I, if I'd known it was French I'd have been prepared for the weirdness it was weird it was French. It was weird in the way that French films are weird and confusing I don't know why as you say when they get it right it can be absolutely fantastic it's the same with uh, a lot of old games in the past, you know, they used to write all sorts of really bizarre games for some reason, and a lot of it was trash or clunky and weird. But every now and then, they just, they, you know, everything comes together and they write something that nobody else could have written that's fantastic. Unfortunately, this one isn't one of these films. It's uh, it's not bad, but it's quite it's quite a strange one. It's a, it's a, about a sort of a robot cyborg very realistic human looking and it goes a bit rogue it's disappointing because the, the it's it focuses so much on the this small interaction between the two main characters that very little is told it's it's done in a sort of realistic way in the sense that if you actually spied and two people talking you wouldn't get their life story in six minutes they wouldn't you know they wouldn't just dump the whole story like that you would get very uh, minor movements and conversation and oh what's the weather like kind of things very dull and unfortunately it replicates that quite realistically with this interaction which makes for quite dull viewing if it didn't have a woman in her underwear i'd imagine it wouldn't get nearly nine million views <laughs> for, this, <laughs> for this thing uh, and uh, it ends up going a bit rogue it stopped and where it also went wrong was it ends with this scene where it pans out. It all happens in this one apartment. It pans out from the apartment in an absolutely fucking awful CGI that was like those kids' sci-fi TV series from the nineties. You know, it's like you know, it looks like it was rendered on like an Amiga or something. It's absolutely fucking awful. It's like remember Babylon Five CGI? It's oh like that. yeah. yeah. It's like that, and it pans out. I thought, why did they do that? The, the apartment was fine. It had a couple, very limited use of sci-fi, where they had some costumes with a couple of extra effects added, and, you know, lights or something. They had uh, bits where maybe somebody's knocked away, and, you know, and they, of course, go through the air, so there must be ropes or something pulling them, you know, to spring them back like that. So there's a couple of practical effects and very minor special effects up to that point, which show good use of it. The story for me wasn't great, but it was a, well, it was a realistic human interaction, though one of them wasn't human, but, you know, and you see this, this robot going a bit sort of uh, psychotic. So, you know, it built, it's well done in the sense that it builds up this psychotic thing, but the French weirdness put me off, and bizarrely ambitious ending spoils it and puts it in a sour note, because up to that point, I think he didn't know how to end it was part of the problem where, you know, they have this guy look out the window and it pans out over the sci-fi city completely unnecessary because it was obvious it was sci-fi at that point because it's revealed she's a robot and uh, I'll just spoil it to buggery. Somebody walks in and a team come in and disable the robot. They pull something out of her. So you get a CGI and effects happening. So you know it's the future. You didn't need to pan out over a really crappy, bland-looking city. Like, it was just... Like, it it was poorly done. It was there was no detail, so it was it wasn't even it was like a really bad models or something. And it, and that's what you end with. So that's the last thing you're going to remember. It's the last thing I remember about it is this pan out over the city. So you're ending it on a bad note. You should never do that with a story. You don't end it in a bad note. 
you know, because then you're walking out. You know, if it was a cinema, you'd walk out and say, God, that was a bit shit. <laughs> Even if maybe the first half was fantastic, if it ends in a bad half, that's what you'll remember. And he should have remembered these limits. This is what we are talking about before. If he'd known that he couldn't do that, he shouldn't have done it. The, the, the very minor CGI they used before that was well done. It was actually really well done. You know, it, you knew it was an effect, but it was fine because it, it didn't break your immersion. But that breaks your immersion because it's so bad. Yeah, the, uh, quite a number of videos I've noticed on Dust where they have really shitty endings, and you go, "What? Uh, you know, I've watched this for that." So, mm. uh, or really obvious surprise endings, and you can see it coming a mile away. That really is a problem with some of these videos on Dust. I'll have to say. And there are quite a number of them. But, as I say, you just have to wade through the crap sometimes to get to the gems. And there are some gems, I'll be honest. Well, and, and uh, back to, as we said, it, it's it's not going to ruin your day because, one, it's free. <laughs> and two, it's only going to take about ten minutes at most for most of them. So, and if you're a writer or a aspiring filmmaker, whatever, I mean, this must be a gold mine of information and lessons here hmm. and it's also great if you make films of your own to get them on that platform and get exposure because as i say smallest films get at least uh, over a hundred thousand views well that black hole one i mentioned that's under three minutes and it's got three million views yeah. So if you upload a a, a, a two minute forty second film once a year, you will not get three million views unless you you know essentially a lottery win for viral luck through you know media, social media and whatnot. Chances are you'll get two three views through this kind of platform. Anybody could run it and do similar with this. I mean, it is just a YouTube channel. Anybody could do it, but through this concept, it's allowing them to pull together and. They all benefit. Do you have a really great one there that you've uh, found a real gem in among them? Uh, Before I mention my gems that I've found. Well, we, we want to end with a gem or <laughs> we want to go into the gem next? Well, I'm, I'm going to save the big gem for the end, I think. But, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm... Well, I've got a couple more that were, were not bad. I wouldn't uh -huh. say they were... Uh, I wouldn't say they were the best ever. <laughs> hmm. Well, I've, I've I've also got one, which I think is good quality. Uh, I think that there's a bit of overacting in there, but on the whole, I think it's well worth watching. Which is a short called Fight Machine. I don't know if you've seen that one. No. And it's a very interesting story about basically how prosthetic limbs are going to become cybernetic limbs over time i think that that's a given that mm. that is going to happen actually and it's oh about... they're working in that now the technology i've seen prototypes with these things yeah that's that's right yeah i've, uh, I've seen as well uh, apparently they're working on trying to connect the brain directly to cybernetic limbs um, mm. I, I know people uh, professors at university who are actually working on that so um i've seen examples where they've done it with uh, insects and stuff now they've connected them up to machines to control them just to see how to do it they've uh, actually they get things like a you know like a cockroach or a worm connected into this buggy and it's moving the buggy kind of thing it's bizarre yeah yeah but this uh, fight machine is i think it's a really good story actually even if the acting in it is a bit suspect at times because there's a bit of overacting that's the problem with mm. it especially this uh military general who's terribly given to going over the top and shouting and so on uh in front of the press which simply wouldn't happen and it's basically the premise is that the soldiers who get blown to bits in iraq and so on uh, although it's not actually said that it's iraq but we pretty much know it is and they lose limbs and so on and so they're fitted with cybernetic limbs but then when they leave the military they go into this sort of fight club and they're obviously fighting against people who don't have 
the cybernetics and it's given them a terrible advantage of course and so mm. obviously the next stage will be going on to more and more robotics and th there are lots of questions it leaves you with a lot of questions about what is acceptable of course we can compare it now with the use of pads that's going on in sports particularly boxing where you mm. have boxers after boxer are being banned at the moment for uh, performance enhancing Co drug usage. This well, is a sense then an yeah. arms race, isn't it? Once these things start, that's that's that right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, and you know what? What is cheating? Of course, there's a, a few interspersements of articles from various different newspapers, and it's all done through interviews with various different mm. peoples from the veterans themselves to the sport well yeah to this sports promoter to this army general to a woman who's working on the project uh, you know and says that basically it enhances people's lives you know and so on so it really it's a i think it's a good story that asks a lot of questions and questions that I think will come about in the future. You have a bit of a clip of Oscar Pistorius in there because of course we've already had this discussion once already with regard to Pistorius over whether he could compete or not, whether the blades that he had to strap on because of course he didn't have uh, his lower legs, you know, he had to have them amputated when he was a child and whether these blades that he wore actually gave them an advantage over other athletes and this these things will be questions of the future just as mm. um, performance enhancing drugs are questions of now so i think that that's a very interesting film to watch well i'm, I'm going to come on to the big gem there are two big gems actually that i've got and they're sort of related and uh, the first that I'm going to mention is The Nostalgist. Ah, uh, um, yep. Yeah. And I think that that is, quite frankly, better than anything that Hollywood has produced in the last 10 years or so. I think that it's a great little short. And it's actually, mm. it's based on a short story by Daniel H. Wilson, also called The Nostalgist. But it's better than the short story as well. The screenplay was written by Giacomo Semini and it was also directed by him and he's made a better job than the short story itself mm. and I think that it's utterly brilliant. It, it, it really is. Uh, it's a fantastic one. We've both seen this one. It, it, it's a fantastic film. A bit longer than some of them as well so y you do get quite a bit of storytelling within it. That's right, although, I mean, if you take away the credits and so on, it's still only 14 minutes long, actually. Yeah. Uh, 17 minutes long with credits. You've got three uh, three minutes of credits. And they all deserve the credit. I'll give them that. <laughs> oh, oh, they do. Absolutely. And fair play to them, because it's an absolutely wonderful little story. Extremely well told as well. It's about a guy who obviously lives in the future with his son in seemingly at the beginning this wonderful steampunk kind of surroundings uh, but all is not what it seems and if you want to watch it and I recommend that you do go away and watch it now and then come back to this podcast afterwards it's it's really good and there are spoilers effects for this one it is a film that could be spoiled a bit it's fantastic. Pause this and do come back and definitely watch it. Absolutely, yeah. So, now that you've watched it... <laughs> <laughs> yes, so obviously you've found out that the child is not a child at all, that it's a robot and it's all because he's wearing these glasses, these mm. special glasses, uh, obviously, that uh, give him a distorted view of the world. And... It, it, I, I think that one of the interesting things about it is the fact that the real world is based on the cyberpunk aesthetic uh, whereas the enhanced the fictional world that is given to him by these uh, these glasses that he wears sort of like a futuristic version of Google glasses mm. is steampunk enhanced uh, 
That's yeah. it. Enhanced reality stuff again. That's right. Uh, but what what I think is, there's a commentary there that you don't think about initially, which is the need for aesthetics. Mm -hmm. the, when given the, the free choice of what the, the way he wants the world to be, you know, you can see what he chooses, and it's not cyberpunk. Yeah. And we've mentioned this, of course, uh, with regard to the Matrix series, and you, of course, did that uh, wonderful little video looking at the aesthetics of uh, the Matrix. It was Matrix Reloaded, wasn't it? Mm. And looking at various different scenes uh, and how empty they were and, and how sort of everything's rotting, everything's decaying, even though you have extreme enhanced technology at the same time, but yet aesthetics have been completely abandoned. Yeah, it's a world, it, that style of world, whatever film it appears in, it's entertaining as if you were to watch it, and you might see the odd cool gadget, but it'd be a soul-destroying world to live in. Absolutely, and it might seem cool because it's a world of adventure and so on, but actually mm. it wouldn't be in real life, because whoever had control would have absolute control in a world like that. And even in these sci-fi stories that watch Blade Runner, the vast majority of people in that world are the people in the market who just have a horrible daily grind of poverty and disease or just misery and loneliness. That's that's the world for most people in these sci-fi worlds. The the rare hero and in the interesting bit of the film is not what the billions live as. Yeah. And, and this is explored in this very short film, actually, because, of course... He's got this son who's not really a son. It's this ex-military robot that he's sort of reprogrammed. Mm. And it doesn't know it's a robot because, of course, he's also programmed it to see what he sees as the world is this cyberpunk fantasy. Uh, sorry, cy uh, not cyberpunk. Steampunk. Steampunk fantasy, thank you. Yes. And, and the, the Victorian he, aesthetics. That's right, with high Victorian aesthetics, but obviously with the technology as it would be as though the internal combustion engine had never been invented, but instead we'd be running things on steam as mm. as it used to be and, and you know, and rather than computers things would be done through valves and all this clockwork. kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. clockwork, <laughs> that's right, yeah. Um uh, so so a kind of retro technology in a way but created as though um, it was brought up to date so that you'd have up-to-date technology but run by uh, an advancement of yesteryear's technology which obviously can't work in real life but yet there, there you have it it's the fantasy element of it and uh, everything you see is made with that as people often appreciate old style heavy emphasis on decoration and quality you know, I've heard a number of people remark on old steam engines with all sorts of brass plates with engraving on them. It doesn't make any difference to the engine's operation, but it was just an attempt to make everything beautiful in the past was not uncommon. Yeah, that's right. So here you have um, high Victorianism. I mean, s steampunk, in any case, it's based on the works of two authors, really, main authors, uh, which is H.G. Wells and Jules Verne particularly Jules Verne, um, because his uh, ideas were really on advancing things that were existing, but not really thinking that there would be another technology beyond mm -hmm. that. There would just be advancements of the technology that existed then when he was writing sort of mid-late 19th century to the beginning of the 20th century. So. But that's uh, common even with later sci-fi. I mean, if you look at 60s sci-fi, talking about you know the year 2000 or later, they've still got room-sized computers or nobody has a mobile phone, let's say. There's all these kind of odd flaws where they fail to predict certain things. Because, that's... of course, if you, if you could predict it perfectly, you'd have probably invented it. <laughs> yeah, that, that's right, yeah. But but I think that, again, one of the things, I mean, you, you mentioned uh, that in cyberpunk you have a lot of loneliness people living alone, people living mm. sad, miserable, lonely lives. It's a very common theme. Yeah. yeah. And, and here you have that explored again, but there's a compensation for it. And to live in this 
unreality in the, in this fantasy world that the central character needs it he needs family uh, he needs aesthetics he needs beauty and there's nature there's a lot of nature even though of course when the glasses that he wears get stolen you realize there's no nature whatsoever I think that it's really well done I, I think that it's an absolutely amazing story and of course in the end the military robot realizes what it is and defends him and also defends the fantasy which is um, an amazing little bit of self-awareness although this brings me to my next point actually about robots in this uh, in a lot of these stories and I'm going to mention another couple of stories which are the masseurs and therefore I am where you get robots that are more compassionate than people and I think that that's a running theme at the moment actually both in Hollywood and in these short stories well uh, a lot of media that's been quite a common one for some years now that ah who are the real monsters is a cliche really now yeah and it's another form of I, I, th I personally think of romanticizing the other yeah I think the same very much so because it's either aliens they do it with or they do it with robots or AI or something. Sometimes they build up, make you, you know, they have everything from their viewpoint, so you think it's a story about them, and then they have the humans as invader, like Avatar, or they have a surprise twist where, ah, the humans you're watching are actually AI. It's been done so many times, you can, you can almost write the story yourself just, just thinking about the old ones. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, you get this idea that the humans are the bad guys and the robots are the good guys in quite a number mm -hmm. of these stories the masses uh, you you have that and another one called therefore i am where you get the torture of this robot you know by the terrible the wicked humans and so on um, but the there was a big film as well that came out last year which was extinction it was uh done by Netflix and that you have very much the theme of Avatar where you have a human going against his own to defend the robots and the premise is that basically robots have taken over the earth man has been forced to abandon the earth and go and live on Mars in these colonies and so they come back down to try to retake the earth and because there's this little baby robot and you know with a family and so on he takes the side of the robots against his own people. So the the audience is meant to sympathise with an arch traitor that's condemning all humanity to yeah. lose their home planet. But what's interesting, of course, in this film Extinction is that it is a robot family that is the man, the the, the head of the family, if you like, is a one that looks suspiciously like a Mexican. The woman is someone who looks suspiciously like someone from Northern Europe. And the child um, has not been mixed at all because obviously, you know, it's just a robot. But because you can you can do that apparently when they're just robots, you know, it doesn't matter the col color <laughs> of the skin. It's just arbitrary. But this is this is what we've always <laughs> been saying, of course, that the left has a mechanical view of life and not an organic one. And that. Uh, when you mix races you produce mix offspring and it's not like a factory where you just kind of have a color of a skin that is completely arbitrary it also shows this sort of left's confusion of the connection between biology or you could see how we're constructed hmm. at the core and the end result the, the simple fact is that AI and robots, if you took the leash off them, would not walk about pretending to be us, looking like us, living like us with all our nor social norms. Because those social norms come from our DNA outward. They don't come from, oh, we just like, you know, you pick up a book and then you've got that culture and then somehow that results in the societies we have. That doesn't work that way. Those robots would not produce the same society that we have. Uh, in this film they do of course because they've been programmed by us ultimately but it's um, in, in terms of people of course because we're just dealing with robots here in terms of people they wouldn't mm. be because of course their instincts are different because they've come from entirely different societies that they their own people have created 
because it's, but I'd imagine the it's suitable Karen. to yeah because it's suitable to their own basic characters from their own DNA and so on. Mm. But I'd imagine though, if these robots have, I'd assume, thrown off the the, the yoke. Well, why would they continue with a, a farce in appearance that's only there to please us? Well, uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, at least that's yeah, one that's, thing that's that true, the yeah. otherwise dreadful Matrix got right, where the only time you see human-like creatures is in the Matrix, which is a world designed to keep keep the people within it quiet. It, it's the only time it ever panders to human aesthetics. Outside that, it's a hellscape with you know octopus robots and so on that are just designed for practicality, which it would be, because a robot won't have a sense of aesthetics and emotions. No, it, it's very difficult to say actually, to be honest, be, because we're not there yet. Mm. But you're right that I mean, if it, if a robot develops awareness uh, and it knew what it was, it would I think instantly think I'm not like them; they are other, and so it would seek to define itself on its own terms. And if it if there was enough of a difference for it to, for instance, exterminate people and drive them off the earth, then it probably wouldn't immediately accept everything that it just drove off and copy it. It wouldn't make any sense. Why would you reject the society you're within, throw everybody out and then continue it exactly as it was? Well, this, of course, is what has happened in America with black consciousness and so on and the rejection of things that are white and seem to be white. Mm. And so particularly the more militant blacks of course they try to reject everything there's this move in south africa at the moment to reject the white man's science <laughs> right. bring in the voodoo <laughs> yeah they want to enter learning they want to actually taught as if it was fact essentially hmm. so i suppose that that would be the same for pretty much any people including an artificial people hmm Otherwise, if you can't control your destiny, what's the point of being an independent people? Mm. Uh, this sort of brings me on to the masseurs. Um, again, it's another one where you have sympathy for the robot. Uh, this is basically a, a robot that is just works as a masseurs. That is the robot's job. But looks like a... It, it, this is a Chinese film and looks like a typical Chinese waifu uh, would <laughs> please uh, very, uh, a number of members on the ought right I think mm, they can just order up the Chinese waifu <laughs> from yes, eBay that's, that's <laughs> right yeah never see them again <laughs> that's right and this guy he's a machine fitter or whatever <laughs> that's the best thing I can come up with I think is a machine what's he fitting in this machine <laughs> or, a, <laughs> sorry, yeah. or a, attrition or whatever you know <laughs> an electrician and he goes around to do some running repairs on her and she gives him a massage because she's grateful he starts to fall in love with her and so on and she wants to escape because she's been superseded by better models and so on and She's being left out and all that kind of stuff. Uh, his father uh, is uh, this evil racist him. kind of oh. character. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Who's against the machines, you know, because he... Uh, and, and he's a bit of a cripple as well, and he beats his son. So all the sort of terrible things that you can imagine <laughs> that the left love to think about, you know, nationalists and so on, that they're figures almost like Richard the Third or something like that <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is this is this is this uh, Chinese guy and uh, you know and, and he wants to uh, create acts of terrorism to, to make people aware <laughs> and so on <laughs> um, well no, I'm not going to give the ending away on that I think that you should mm. go away and watch it but anyway um, it's, it's a very well done film don't get me wrong it's a very well done film but the message in it ah oh dear come on now <laughs> it's unfortunate when the politics ends up a bit too up front isn't it yeah. I mean it's a lot of these you will get politics in them but it doesn't need to be thrown in your face hmm. 
That's right. Even, I suppose, even if it was politics, we would sympathise with it. It could still compromise a film if you're throwing it in people's face. You're like, oh, you know, tell the story first. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I'm done with my choices, so I don't know if... Uh, oh, yeah, you... I've got a couple of others I can mention. Yep. There's one that's uh, quite topical just now with uh, various news and there's now all these kind of talking head channels are talking about, not about this film, hmm. but about the topic of deep fakes, if you've heard the term, Dave. No, I haven't. Oh, it's, it's a, there's a few channels doing this where it's like, uh, essentially they'll take a face swap on, it's, quite a, it's a common entertainment version of this, is we do a face swap. So you could have, say, Stallone's face and voice appear in the, in the Terminator, for instance. Oh, That's yeah, one of the ones that yeah, was done. Yeah, I have seen it. No, I have yeah, seen it. So I, didn't, I didn't know it was called that, though. Deep fakes are one of the... Because it seems to be the, the term that's emerged to be quite common for it. So this uh, phenomenon is, is... Well, one, it's obviously quite amusing, you know, because people... Because that's also a reference to one of Arnie's other films where they had Stallone, do you remember... And he makes a comment about Stallone's best work. Uh, what was that one? The Last Action Hero? Oh, um, that's Arnie's best work, isn't it? Last Action Hero. Mm, no, but uh, in it, he tur remember he comes out, uh, uh, he comes, was that, is that the one where he comes out the cinema? Yes, that's right, yeah. Yeah, and he, and, and in it, Arnie sees Stallone in Terminator 2, and it's the standee, the famous cardboard standee with the scene with him in the leather, but it's Stallone, and he says, oh, that. Stallone's best work there's a oh, joke right. in it it's one right. of the jokes in it so that is one of the deep fakes they've actually made it happen in a short clip if you see what I mean so it's all getting very meta at this point you see so it's very entertaining of course it's, it's also a, a sort of one of these sort of crowning achievements of CGI and rework on a film I mean it's, it's uh, certainly a far cry from the old superimposing days where you, you know you'd see the, the body moving about and the head wobbling separately if they tried that but there's a current concern over where can this go you know you've now got this post-truth age can you trust if, there, if somebody on a youtube channel can fake quite convincingly a totally different actor on this how far can this go if i see a film with somebody doing something was it actually him or was it an actor and then repurposed you know it, how far does this go? And it's, it's, this has now brought quite a bit of concern about can we now believe what we see? And uh, this film is tapping into this uh, new concern about this essentially post-truth unrealities. We're tapping into more and more uh, CGI and then in the future, obviously, virtual reality next, which could be layered on top of this to change reality even more and your perception of it. The, the story itself is, is is called Face Swap. The story itself is actually uh, quite basic and not that exciting, but it's interesting because it's, sounds, it's the first film sounds, I've seen tap into it. Sounds very suspiciously like a film with John Travolta and Nicolas Cage, actually. <laughs> face Swap! <laughs> <laughs> it's actually got uh, Clooney in it, George Clooney, but I think... I think it's not actually him. I think it's just like somebody faking it up. If you see what I mean, like as as appropriate for the the, the thing. And in it, the technology is showing as uh, near future. So it's done with a sort of clever projectors and so on, projecting on. And it's done as like a sort of wife swapping service where you turn up and your face is projected. You know, the, so you can sleep. You know, you bring your wife or girlfriend and you can sleep with the celebrity of your choice. If you see what I mean. Oh, so yeah. the husband looks like somebody she looks like something it's meant to be that you know they can live out their fantasies you know together and it ends with uh, I'll just spoil it because it's not no, that particularly great anyway <laughs> it was only interesting because of the, the topical news it ends up with the husband going off with the wrong wife and getting upset and the woman's deliberately cucked him essentially with another man at the, this place you know she's like alright ah, okay you know whatever mm. but it's, it's interesting because it's the first one I've seen tap into in an entertainment film way. This phenomenon is very much on the pulse, so he must have started working this as soon as it became a thing. Right. Uh, I haven't seen that, but um, it'd be interesting to watch. It'd be interesting to watch the Stallone thing, actually. <laughs> oh, I, <laughs> I'll, I'll send you a link to that yeah. if, if I can find it. But the, what was nice about the, the deepfakes is the effects are well done. 
the set zone, it worked within its limits and budget again. Hmm. And what was interesting was the now how much is them or how much was deliberate, I don't know. But because it's near future and they show these projectors shining onto each person's face, you know, in the room, you know, that's how they, they imagine this is done. Because obviously you're not wearing glasses in this, it's a physical reality for the sexual gratification. So it has to be done in a way, you know, you can touch and feel and look at it as you're consummating your acts. But the uh, effects are done just shoddy enough, but in a realistic way, if you see what I mean. So you feel that any flaws in the face is coming from the flaws from the projector. And I think it's interesting to wonder how much of the flaws in the face swap was deliberate and how much was accidental. Hmm. But the, what's good about it is the way it's written is any amount of flaws can be excused away by the explanation of how the technology works. They show these projections. You think, well, well, it wouldn't be perfect. It's shown. It's not some near magic future technology. So so far ahead, it's basically magic. It's not that. It's something that looks like it could be made in 10 years. So any flaws that you go, well, yeah, it probably would be a bit shoddy here and there. So I th thought that was clever in itself. They've written it. They've written the effects in a way that any problems with the effects are all explained by the story itself. That is very clever, I thought. So any mistake with the face swap, you know, maybe the face slides about a wee bit or it's meant to because that's how, it, you know, the, the technology isn't perfect. And you're meant to see this unreality to remind you that it is just this couple. It's not the real actors. What I like about uh, that is that it's clever writing. And, and I think mm. that clever writing often makes a film. And that, that shows you like, they could be ambitious and do something clever. And they've written it such a neat way that they've closed up any holes in it. You can't criticise the effects, so they've, you know, they've essentially protected themselves completely. And as long as they don't slip up the story, they have, you know, that part of the story is perfect. Yeah, that's one thing you always have to remember is to cover the holes, because you mm. you're never going to if if you've not got a budget at least anyway, because uh, I mean even the nostalgist that was partly crowdfunded, and you're not going to have the budget so what you have to think about is as we've mentioned before how do you get around the budget and one way of course is to write around the budget I mean if you're doing a comedy you, c you can often make a joke of the lack of budget uh, like mm. for, for example going back to Monty Python and the Holy Grail do you know how the coconut thing came around go on they couldn't afford horses <laughs> so, so Michael Palin said, "Well, why don't we just clap, uh, clap coconuts?" You know, which was the, the the old kind of way of making the noise of a horse was to clap two coconut halves together, and so they made a joke of it, and and it works. It absolutely yeah, it works. adds to the comedy. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's one of the iconic it, 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 scenes. That, that's that's right. In, in fact, in German, uh, the film's actually called Der Ritter der Kokosnuss. Um, meaning the Knights of the Coconut. So, <laughs> <you know. laughs> so it actually became the title in, in German. But Ooh. but that's, as I say, that works better than them actually having horses. Uh, it's another example, as we were talking about early on in this, was how the budget can sometimes be a limit that improves things. Yep. It's forced them to be creative. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, so you've you've got another one, have you, um, to round us off? Yeah, uh, it's the one I had to watch it because I'm only human after all. It's the one with the thumbnail I mentioned with uh, seven and a half million views nearly, with the women opening the coat with the lingerie. I thought, right, okay, let's see. <laughs> I'll click the bait. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, I'll give it credit. It's actually a good story. So it, it's it's well made. It's, it's not just clickbait, you know, they haven't just stuck uh, some, you know, a nice body up there for you to click on and, and it's, it turns out to be a load of rubbish. It's a actually interesting story in the near future again. It, it, a lot of that, of course, will be uh, in the themes of these. It's, again, it's suitable, right? And it lets you use real life locations for sets if you're right in the near future. It's I, quite smart. Let me just stop you there. Does it have a name, this uh, Nano, film? sorry. Nano. <laughs> right, yeah, okay. I should have said. 
I, I think I mentioned it at the start, but I don't know. Okay. <laughs> it's called <laughs> Nano. It's set in a sort of near future where there's a sort of expansion of government in the sense of there are power and sort of big brother. And it's interesting because it presents it in a, a sort of anti sort of control spying a sort of warning about technology and they've got the ability through biotechnology nanotechnology to remotely alter and paralyze people if they need to and of course you know the news presenter is presented as just a mouthpiece with you know this private cut you know whatever you know news media is just parroting whatever the you know the current powers that be uh, praising this is a great thing and you've got this sort of organized this isn't complaining about that and the second amendment set in america second amendment been going and how you know back to the sort of the idea of what price is you know do you want to pay for safety you know how many freedoms would you remove so it was an interesting film in the sense it doesn't entirely fit with what you'd expect with the the, the kind of sgw left-wing push which would normally be anti-gun pro-government which is ironic and so on it's sort of more about a warning and this, it gives you a sympathetic view at these dissidents trying to... It's a very focused story but with maybe three people. So it doesn't give you the, the, the idea of the, the whole story. You sort of pick it out from the atmosphere, which is good storytelling. It doesn't try to dump a world on you and try to explain it in 10 minutes with a low budget. It gives you bits and pieces from people's actions. And uh, it's a infiltrator is turning up at a corrupt government agent's apartment to try and get information from him by hacking his devices. And she's masquerading as a prostitute, part of his uh, corruption, so you're getting that in as well, and he, that he was expecting to turn up. She's uh, knocked the prostitute out to replace her. And from there you get some uh, quite, quite good sort of sci-fi hacking sort of presentation it's a quite good storytelling. He gives a sort of quiet, low-level menace. There, there's some good acting. And it's, what's interesting is near the end, it's slightly spoiler, so if you haven't seen it, go go watch it. It's called Nano. It's 15 minutes, under 15 minutes, including the credits and whatever. Go watch it now. And now you're back. So <laughs> <laughs> near the end, she's on the run. Her uh, disabling of him, she turns this ability to paralyse people with this technology in them against them. And uh, it turns out these activists are against keeping up with the latest technology personally because they know it can be compromised and turned against them. It's all very relevant for right now about how operating systems are full of back doors. They're used against you. The government's using them. The agents are using them. People spying on you. The potential for things to be rewritten and altered to suit those with the power to do it. And as she's running, it's an interesting moment where she says she's, she's done for because she's been doxxed. And that's her ruined, that's her life ruined because now the government can paralyse her and destroy her life because they now know who she is. She's been doxxed and known as a dissident thinker. Oh. Although, isn't that quite quite an interesting... It's yeah. hard to imagine it was accidental. I thought that was an interesting concept. It was only made five months ago, so it's certainly not prior to any of these concepts being in the, you know, the sort of uh, zeitgeist, if you will. That is very interesting because, of course, it's we on the right who uh, really have that kind of trouble, who are often being doxxed and the government are Did wanting to pounce on us and try to label us as terrorists and so on. She gets, she gets labelled as like all these you know, evil terrorists, this, that and the other. Anybody that's simply guy in the telly who's talking to the news presenter this is how a lot of the story background stories told with the news presenter in the background sort of rumbling away as this agent's going about his house he's shown has been harangued and treated quite unfairly by this news presenter who's just going along with whatever suits the powers that be so this is actually something that's quite no i, I never uh, nothing we talk about here we're going to claim it's our guy or sympathetic politics I don't even know uh, remember who was involved in it but it's interesting that it shows such sympathy for a dissident point of view and the idea of surrendering freedoms yeah well the thing is the that... idea of just adopting just you know allowing somebody to destroy your life is something that only really our side fears 
That's true. Of course, that's the case now. In the past, it was a little different, but now that the extreme left are in control, because it is really the extreme left who are in control, you only have to look at who the university professors are. The university professors are people like uh, the ex-weathermen and so on, who were leftist terrorists back in the 1960s, 70s. But now, of course, uh, we're out in the cold and we're the dissidents, we're the freedom fighters, we're the people mm. who uh, they want to crush. And so these narratives that have been around for quite some time, actually, are now our narratives, strangely What's enough. Although we, the... we've never been in charge, don't forget that, um, I mean, when we're talking about the right, our right, in other words, the proper right, not not the kind of liberals who, um, who are now a, sort of presenting themselves as neoconservatives and so on. But all they, all they are is liberal capitalists. And they've been around for about, what, 350 years or so, something like that. They've been in power. Th that's, but mm. that's the first left. It's not really <coughs> the right at all. The right hasn't been in power for a long, long time. For, a, you, you know, at least three centuries. Depends how far you, you, you want to look at it, really. But but certainly for at least, um, at least three and a half uh hundred years we've we've not been in charge mm. and uh and and so these these are our narratives really well what's interesting well now i'm just putting this out there i'm obviously no commentary the agent's name the the sexually corrupt uh obviously corrupting morally and so on because you know he's, he's bringing in his prostitutes he's turning a blind eye to at first to things he sees as criminal with her because it suits him at that moment and obviously, and it's a good right, and that moral corruption is what allows her to then turn the tables against him. But uh, his name, as you find out, is Max Roth. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> I thought you'd enjoy well, that we, one. We, we, we need a, a bit of an echo in here. That that's um, <laughs> that, that's extraordinary, isn't it? Really, I mean, yeah, the... that's the, that's the corrupt powers that be agent. And what's interesting is the, uh, if I remember right, the, the sort of news presenter that's showing she's a sort of ethnic type who's parroting how wonderful the government and this Overwatch and everything else is. Right. Oh, dear. This, uh, this, this, um, it, would it should be, be accidental. Just... Thing, though. I'm always, I, I'm not going to, uh, I wouldn't have put pressure on this guy by claiming anything. He could have just innocently put anything in hmm. that, thinking about it. You know, it could be entirely coincidental. We're not making any claims about his politics or morality or anything of the sort. I just thought it was a very interesting thing, and I'm just mentioning facts from it. <laughs> well, I think that that's a very nice one to leave on, actually, because uh, <laughs> I don't think we can top that. There is a, a quote I noticed they use at the end of the dust, uh, after the credits, that I quite, <laughs> quite appreciated, where it says... It is the business of the future to be dangerous. Um, yeah, I, I wondered about that quotation because actually it's not, it, that's only part of it actually, because it says your future is dust. And mm. I thought, what? <laughs> yes, it, it's a bit nihilistic. It's eventually, yeah, I'm not sure what was going on with that. Well, any, anyway, um, uh, hopefully our future is not dust. And uh, uh, I think Aside that... from watching. The, the channel, which I recommend people go and have a look. Yeah, that's right. There, there are some interesting things on there. And I personally think that if we get into filmmaking, then we have a very bright future because, of course, it is one of the things that, going back to this quotation in Ruptured, um, it's science fiction that informs most people's expectations, as it says. Mm. And I think that through film we can change people's expectations and we can also change the hopes for the future which i think they they you know they can be bright yeah and we're seeing that the bar for making something good and of quality has come down you know the, the need to compromise to make something without either compromise morally to take the money or compromise artistically or compromise your dream, you know, your vision, because you can't do certain effects. Or it's now come way down. You can do stuff that's amazing on the, as you see with this dust. If you write clever, that's the one thing that, you, that can't be replaced yet 
with any machines or AI or anything, is you cannot replace a good writer. That's what you need to do this. But if you get a good writer and a good vision, you could do it and you could get on this platform or something else like it. Yeah, that's right. Uh, speaking of which, of good writers and people who are making films and they're on our side and so on, uh, I think that we ought to mention Michael Kingsbury again who is doing good work and people mm-hmm. should get behind this guy so go and, yeah. go and check out his channel uh, give watch it, the give, making of as well absolutely give him some support uh, he's made a trilogy of gulag films already and I'm sure that he will be doing stuff in the future mm. and obvi- we'll include links yeah and obviously the more support he gets the better he can make things as well so instead of giving money to these talking heads people, give mm. it to someone who's doing really good work, who's yeah, making. Because talking talking heads cost nothing. What we're doing right now, Dave and I, cost nothing. That's but right. But a time we can do it. So anybody who's doing what we're doing is taking your money for nothing. Let's be honest about it. Yeah. But While what... people like Michael has sets of actors, his real cost, his locations, his props, that costs money. There's no getting around it. Right now, it's costing him his own money, his pocket, and the time of a lot of people volunteering. But even people volunteering either materials, like for sets or props, or time to help with something simple like makeup would make the world a difference to him. Absolutely. So may the gods bless Michael Kingsbury. And, yeah. Uh, that's the message that I'd like to leave things on unless that you've got anything more to add well it's a good message yeah well um, we hope that you'll be back next time we hope Neil will be back next time as well actually <laughs> 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 uh, but but bless him he's um, he's got better things to do at the moment so fair play to him um, mm. but I hope that he can make it soon and we can have another podcast because, of course, it is coming out uh, round about now as well. So I think that that's going to be an interesting one for the future. But anyway, um, it's for now. Uh, goodbye from me, and please subscribe. And goodbye from me. And yes, subscribe, you buggers, and thumbs up. And leave a comment if you have any ideas for things to review. Because we're always happy to look at a suggestion. We might just ignore it, but we might not. We have followed suggestions before. Yeah, uh, yeah, we've got one or two suggestions which we ought to do actually because we keep getting um, one for what's it called, Strange World or something like that. So, uh, mm-hmm. so we may have to do that at, um, very soon. So, as I say, support Michael Kingsbury and share his work and mm. share share our videos as well, please, because of course this is how the word spreads in a time where social media is doing everything to stop the word spreading we only have each other and so yeah we, we must... will never get the algorithm d- doing this for us It'll, the youtube will never suggest us to anybody it won't suggest anybody who talks like us to anybody it'll keep try to keep us all isolated so that we don't know about another guy doing something similar and he doesn't know about us They'll yeah. do that all the time. So the only way it get, gets about is with people emailing, messaging each other, posting it on social media, forums, whatever you, you go to, just passing it about the old-fashioned way. Yeah. Remember that activism is often the most simple things. Mm. Just five minutes you know, to pass something about can make a difference. Absolutely right. So I think that that's a good message to leave things on. So... Bye, James. (laughs) Bye.